Hello everyone, my name is Marika Rekla and welcome to today's Technology Talk webinar. Um, today's session is presented to you by InnoTech um, and the webinar today is on building automation, um, backnet network and mode bus uh, protocol introduction. Um, just before we do get the session underway, um, if you've got any questions throughout the presentation, um, please type them into the Q&A box and then um, we'll allow for some time after the formal presentation to get through as many questions as possible um, within the time permitting. Um, so I'd now like to introduce to you uh, Walter, who is the systems trainer at InnoTech Control Systems Australia, um, who'll be taking us through today's session for you. So Walter, I might pass things over to you now um, to get the session underway. Thank you. Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for that introduction. And uh, thank you, everyone, for making time to attend this session. Now, as Marie said, my name is Walter Koliarko. I'm the systems trainer for Intertech Control Systems for our national and global partner network. I've been with Intertech for about 12 years now and look after the development, deployment, and maintenance of our training programs. So I've been pretty busy over that time. We also have 35 years' experience within the BMS sector with a wide variety of manufacturers, systems and products and have a fairly wide skill set. So today what we're going to do is uh, showcase a couple of popular videos that provide information on two of the most common protocols used in the HVAC building management system projects. And the first one I'm going to look at is the BACnet network numbers uh, and how they're implemented. Uh, show how we can better manage the system network in relation to backnet network numbers. This is an important aspect of backnet network planning when designing the system and uh, in this presentation overlooked. So yeah, we're ready to play. Yeah. Sorry, Maria. I think we need to go back to that backnet. Yeah. Yeah, just getting that up now. In this presentation, we'll discuss BACnet network numbers and how they are used. Essentially, when multiple BACnet networks are created within the site's BACnet network, we create BACnet network segments. These segments require a unique BACnet number assigned to identify them on the site's BACnet topology. The segmented networks are still seen as one large local BACnet over IP network on the site. All the network numbers are configured via Omni using Focus or Omni's web server. Planning the network is an important aspect of the project and should form part of the initial network design document to keep track of the network number topology as shown in this example. Each BACnet segment on the network requires a unique BACnet network number. The network segments help to guide the BACnet traffic and data to specific points and devices on the network, providing a more efficient flow of information around the system. A local network is the internal and local side of a local area network. No data is being transmitted outside of this network and it's kept local. The default network number for the local network is 1. A public network is a wide area network connected to the internet. Public networks allow you to send data out to other networks via a router providing the ability to connect to a remote site or share data across sites. The default public network number is 2. On this local site, we have two Omni controllers and two BACnet over IP power meters connected. As this is using the local network for communications, there is only one BACnet network required. Its network number is set to the default of 1. All BACnet devices will be discovered via one BACnet UDP connection in ICOM. If we connect an MSTP network to the Omni controller, we essentially have created a new BACnet segment which requires a unique network number to be set. 
When the port is activated as MSTP, the network number defaults to 3. This is due to the fact that numbers 1 and 2 are already in use for the local and public networks. As mentioned earlier, the BACnet networks are seen as one BACnet network and all these BACnet devices will be seen in ICOM via one BACnet UDP connection. As additional BACnet network segments are created, in this case by adding a new MSTP connection to the Omni controller, the network number must be checked and configured. In this example, I have assigned network number 4 to the new segment. All the BACnet devices will be discovered via the BACnet connection in ICOM. If duplicate network numbers are used, this creates a conflict and the network segments will not be found and essentially are offline. Either of the port settings will need to be corrected by altering the port's network number to be unique. This will then allow the networks to function correctly. Here I've added an MSTP device on the other Omni controller. Following the procedure, I've configured the new network segment as network number 5. This new MSTP device can then be discovered by the BACnet connection in ICOM. The public network is used for access to the site via router. The public BACnet network is another segment with a network number 2 by default. ICOM can connect to this site via a BACnet foreign device connection. All BACnet devices are discovered via this connection. For more information on remote network connections, refer to the networking videos. The network number settings can be configured via Focus or Omni's web server. If the settings are configured via the web server, ensure that the configuration is transferred back into Focus to obtain the final updated configuration. During the design process, when using BACnet comms inputs or outputs, we recommend using the specific network number target. As shown in this example, I have set the BACnet comms input to read back the analog value from the BACnet MSTP device installed on network number 3. This helps to optimise and create an efficient BACnet network traffic flow. This also can be used for the BACnet comms output block to target a specific device and object on a specific network number. In summary, each network segment must have a unique network number assigned. The local network number is 1 and the public network number is 2 by default. When an Omni comms port is configured as MSTP, it will default to network number 3. All the network numbers are not auto-assigned other than the defaults and will need to be checked and adjusted when creating the networks to prevent duplicates. Okay, so that was the uh, network numbers video, and um, hopefully that's uh, provided some validation to, to people. As uh, Mary mentioned, we can uh, take some questions at some point, or if you want to ask some questions, we can collate them and get back to you at a later stage as well. And the next, next video itself is an introduction to the Modbus protocol, uh, a little bit different to BACnet. If you're familiar with BACnet, Modbus itself is a Bit of a um, harder protocol, not, not so much harder, but it's more uh, takes a bit of time to learn and understand how it works. Um, being a, a industry protocol, it's used everywhere uh, these days, and it's as standardised as BACnet is. So, yeah, watching this video, hopefully, it'll uh, give you a bit more insight into what Modbus is and how it works, and uh, how to how to use the uh, protocol itself. In this video, we'll be covering the Modbus protocol and explain the functionality when applied to an Omni project in a simplified format. Many devices utilise the Modbus protocol and they can be common devices installed on a typical BEMS project. 
The device data values that we are interested in from a Modbus device are usually binary and analog values that are stored as scalar data. This means that the format is a simple numeric value of various sizes in data length. A Modbus device holds data values in storage areas called registers. Different types of registers hold different types of data and offer various functionality. A Modbus master device asks or queries a connected slave device for information held in the registers. In our project, the Modbus master will be the Omni BEMS controller. The slave responds back with the information asked by the master. This will all work fine if the master has queried the slave in the correct manner with the correct parameters. If not, Modbus has built-in error checking that can provide some feedback. There are two main types of transports that are used with Modbus. Remote Terminal Unit, or RTU, is the most common method to connect devices due to its lower cost RS-485 connection topology. Modbus TCP is also used in the industry and allows a Modbus protocol to utilise the Ethernet network as a transport. Note that this uses IP port 502 to guide the Modbus traffic around the local area network. The Modbus RTU network uses a two-wire daisy chain RS-45 connection topology. This follows the standard RS-45 rules including the end-of-line termination resistors to balance the line. No more than 32 devices should be connected to the network as this is the allowable maximum number. All slave devices need to be given a valid address or ID from 1 to 247. Zero is a broadcast address used by the master and cannot be used as a slave address. Always check the manufacturer's documentation for correct installation procedures and specifications. The items shown here are for general reference only. In this example, we can see that the Omni has a Modbus protocol activated and RTU is being used to connect the devices to the Omni RS-485 comms port. Note the addressing starts from one and is sequential up to the last device. Each device on this link will also need to be set to the same board rate that the comms port is configured to. Modbus TCP devices require an Ethernet connection to the local area network. This can incur a higher install cost but can also offer many more devices connected to the system with a more flexible installation topology. The number of TCP devices can also depend on the device address limitations so be sure to check the device documentation. Each TCP device requires an IP address and a Modbus device slave identifier address from 1 to 247. The Modbus TCP devices have been added to our Omni project. Each device has been assigned the appropriate IP address and slave identifier. Omni can utilise both the RTU and TCP Modbus protocols at the same time on the project which provides a flexible integration workflow. As we mentioned earlier, Modbus uses a query and response system for communications. The master always initiates a query to ask the slaves for information. Only one master can exist on the RTU network. Modbus TCP can have multiple masters. For example, two Omni controllers with Modbus TCP protocol active can query one Modbus TCP device for the same information, or any TCP devices on the network. In this example, Omni has been configured with the Modbus protocol using RTU and is asking the power meter for the voltage for line 1. The slave responds back with the value as shown. The Modbus comms input used in the Omni configuration just needs to be configured with the correct parameters to successfully ask for the device's register value. As we have seen, the device data is held in the device within storage areas called registers. These can be read-only or read and write and depends on the register type as we'll soon see. So what do you need to read back a device data value? First of all, you must obtain the documented register list. Without this information, you will have a difficult time in locating the registers that you need. There is no auto discovery of data in Modbus. You also need the device slave address, the registers that you require for the project, the type of register that is being used, and if any scaling needs to be applied to the value from the device. Usually data read back from a Modbus device is provided as a basic value without any scaling applied. You then need to make the value a real-world value by entering the correct scaling. 
This may be indicated in the documentation, but sometimes you need to test and make an educated choice for the register that you are reading. We will look at the standard register list used by a majority of Modbus devices, which include four different types. The first type are coils. Coils start at address 1 and go up to 9999. Function code 1 is used to read back this value and function code 5 is used to write a value into the register. Coils hold binary values, zeros and ones. Think of these as a binary output. Input status registers start at 10001 and go up to 19999. Function code 2 is used to read back data values. Inputs hold binary data in a read only. Think of these as binary inputs. An input register starts at 30,001 and goes up to 39,999. Function code 4 is used to read back the data value. Inputs hold analog values and are read only. Think of an input register as an analog input. Holding registers start at 40,001 and go up to 49,999. Function code 3 is used to read the value and function code 6 is used to write a value. These are read and write registers and hold any type of analog value. Holding registers are the most common type used as they provide more flexibility. Refer to the device documentation as only certain registers allow write access and this is determined by the manufacturer. In this example I have a power meter and we need to read back the voltage for the three phases connected. Each value is held in an input register which is a 32-bit integer. You would need to add one Modbus comms input block in the Omni configuration to read each register. As another example, this Modbus sensor has a humidity value and a set point that are held in holding registers which are 16 bit in length. Omni can write to the set point by using a Modbus comms output block set to write to holding register 40006. This simple example sets the foundation of a Modbus integration project. You just need to obtain the correct documentation and data for the device. When examining the device data sheet, you should notice keywords and descriptions that explain how to read or write to a value. In this case, the data sheet advises that the registers used are input registers that are held in two consecutive registers. This is actually a 32-bit register, as the two 16-bit values are provided and combined, they produce a 32-bit value which we will cover later. Notice that the register numbers skip a value as you read down the list. This is generally a giveaway that you're dealing with 32-bit values. The datasheet may also advise if any scaling needs to be applied to the raw values as shown in this Modbus sensor datasheet. In this case, we would need to insert a 0.1 multiplier to obtain the correct scaled value in the Omni Modbus comms input block. Some device documentation may provide the register address in the hexadecimal format. This will need to be converted back to a decimal value to work out the correct offset to use. This can be easily done by the Windows calculator in programmer mode or online converters. An important item to note when setting up the Omni Modbus comms blocks is that the register address is specified as the offset. Looking at the table, we can see that the holding registers start at 40,001. Notice that the offset is 0, as this is the first register, thus 40,001 plus 0 equals 40,001. If we look at the register for the power factor, it is register address 40,006 with an offset of 5. How this works is 40,001 plus the offset value of 5 produces the actual address of 40,006. This then follows along down the list. If you don't have the offset, it is generally the register address minus 1. However, you need to check the data sheet, as manufacturers can provide the Modbus data in a number of creative ways, which may not follow the typical Modbus model. Register values can be signed or unsigned. This simply means if the register can hold a negative and positive value, or only a positive value as shown in this table. This is decided by the manufacturer and should be listed in the device documentation. The correct type needs to be configured in the comms blocks, otherwise incorrect values can be obtained. A signed integer can hold a negative and positive value. An unsigned integer can only hold a positive value. Floating point registers are used when the value includes a decimal function, such as a temperature value. Sometimes these are called real values in the datasheet. 
Omni supports all the standard Modbus registers and length types up to 64-bit values. For larger registers, such as 32-bit, the device can combine two 16-bit registers to provide the 32-bit value. How these numbers are transmitted to the master depends on how they have been configured by the manufacturer. This is usually in the big Endian format. This means that the upper 16-bit register is transmitted first, then the lower 16-bit register is transmitted. The master then needs to combine these two register values to formulate the 32-bit value. Refer to the datasheet for this information, as the reverse may be true, which is referred to as little endian. In this example, the value shown is made up of two 16-bit registers. As stated, the device may transmit these in big or little endian formats. The transmitted format does not matter, as long as the master knows how to interpret the data. If the registers are read in the wrong way, a very different result will be provided, as we'll see in the next slide. Here we can see the result of the transmitted order and how it can affect the actual value shown at the master device. If the upper register is read first, the value is not what is expected. Reading the lower 16-bit register first provides the correct value for this 32-bit register. If needed, the byte order can be swapped in the Modbus comms block to provide the correct value. This can be done via focus or live in the Omni Web Server Monitor session, which is valuable during testing or commissioning. Modbus does provide some error checking and error codes. This list provides the most common error codes that you may encounter during the initial testing commissioning process. Error codes 1, 2 and 3 would be the most common codes encountered during initial testing. These codes are also displayed in text form via the fault node on the Modbus comms input block in the monitor session. During the test and commissioning phase, you can utilise tools built into the BEMS controller, such as the Modbus client, to test and verify the Modbus device registers prior to programming. The device Modbus points can then be utilised in your configuration as outlined in the project specification as shown in this project example. You're also able to check and tweak certain register parameters during the live monitor session, which provides a flexible commissioning and service environment. To summarise the concepts covered in this presentation, the device documentation must be provided and contain adequate information for the device. Without this, you'll be left guessing what data is stored in the device. Also determine if the device will be connected via RTU or TCP networks or both. You can easily connect and integrate both with Omni. The device address needs to be known, including the IP addresses for TCP devices. Once connected and communicating, Test a register to see if you obtain the correct value. Usually, once you read one correct value on the device, all other values should follow the same configuration. For new devices, you may need to bench test the device in a controlled environment. This can assist to locate the correct registers by reading known values, then working out the others from this reference point. Oh, so that's the Modbus protocol, a little bit different to BACnet, and uh, I'm sure that's going to uh, open up a whole box of, of worms for uh, questions later on if you're not familiar with it. But it is a commonly used protocol and uh, very common out there. Thanks for that, Walter. Uh, what we might do now, everyone, is we might move into a bit of a QA. and a um, Walter, there has been a question that has already started to come through the Q&A box. Um, and it's a question there from John, um, who's asking, should the BACnet network numbers appear on a network diagram provided by the BMS contractor and or on the point-to-point -point ITPS for controllers? Well, John, that's a great question. And uh, it's, it's one that uh, needs some thought on and planning at initial start of the project. Now, this all comes back to the network design document. That's the main document that's created prior to any equipment even going on site because it needs to be planned at that initial stage. 
Uh, it's up to the uh, supplier or the provider or the vendor whether they add that information onto the uh, dr official drawings or the network diagram topology. I think it's a it's a good thing to do because being a commissioning tech at the other end of the, the line, that information is invaluable to them, especially when you're fault finding. So I would recommend yes, it it is uh, part of the you know contractor's responsibility to provide that information on, you know, in addition to the site manual or included with the topology drawings for sure. Okay, thanks Walter. Um, if anyone does have questions, please feel free to put them in the Q&A box. Um, we do have a fair bit of time to get through um, as many questions. Um, there is a comment in there from Omar who's asking if we can please share the links to the videos shown. Um, what we do is we do record this webinar session um, and this webinar will be made available up on the AERA website, um, so for viewing. So I'll send around a bit of an email and let everyone know when that does become available as well. Um, so that way you're able to get access to these, um, these videos again. Um, next question we have there is, um, what is the main difference between BACnet and Modebus? Yeah, great question again. And how much time do we have? Because uh, <laughs> they're two totally different <laughs> protocols, really. BACnet itself is a, a protocol developed for HVAC systems by ASHRAE in the US. And it is a, a very common integration protocol. The, the biggest difference that I can say is that there's a lot of automated stuff in BACnet where you can auto discover devices, you can connect and, and get things running pretty quickly. With Modbus, uh, it talks on a totally different protocol and there's no automatic discovery or um, you know, tools that you can use. It's, it's, all, it's a lot more manual process. Uh, and being the two different protocols, the Modbus has been around for a long time and uh, it, it's used everywhere in industrial applications. It's a very um, secure and uh, once it's running, it'll just keep running. It's, it's quite stable. Uh, whereas BACnet can often uh, require some tweaking to get it right and to secure it. And uh, it's, it's, it's a totally different approach to, to getting things talking together. The other main thing with BACnet is it's interoperable. So many vendors can talk to the same building uh, on the same protocol, whereas Modbus isn't, it doesn't have that interoperability built into it. So that's just a brief summary, really. There's a lot of information you can gather from the ASHRAE website and also modicon, uh, modbus.org, where that you can look at the differences between the two. Um, thanks, Walter. Um, and just on that is um, going, flowing on from Michael's question is, do you have any issues integrating um, VRF, VRF control systems with Modbus? With Modbus, look at the end of the day, it depends on what the manufacturer provides and, and what uh, we have available for the project. Uh, anything that has Modbus in it, usually you can integrate with just the same as as Backnet, it, and it comes down to what's on the on the product that you're installing. Some manufacturers don't have Backnet available, so you're sort of stuck with Modbus, you know, communications on that on that particular product or device. Uh, but there's really not that many issues. As long as everything's configured correctly and uh, set up correctly, then it should all work. Mind, mind you, Modbus can be a little bit more difficult to fault find. There are a few things you need to be aware of uh, with that during the commissioning phase and also getting things working. Um, that's the only main difference, really. Thanks, Walter. Um, and you mentioned before that if you want to know more about the difference between them, you can find that. Is that up on ASHRAE, is it? That links it's up on ASHRAE website yeah. uh, and also modbus.org. There is a uh, lots of inf information there available. Yeah, sure. Um, and is another question here. Is there any cost advantage between Modbus and BACnet? Yeah, look, BACnet being a, a standardised protocol, um, because it has so much, so many people behind the scenes developing and maintaining BACnet, there is a slight cost increase to using a BACnet protocol on a device. 
whereas Modbus is a fairly, I guess you could call it a cheaper protocol to use. Uh, just got to keep in mind the advantages and disadvantages of both when you're looking at your project. Um, so I guess it's hard for me to say because I'm not biased either way and I'm not really involved with sales, but um, there is definitely a, a slight increase in costing for a backnet device as opposed to a Modbus device. That needs, that needs to be catered for and factored into the project. And another question we have here that's just come through is what, why are there so many issues with gateways that are used to communicate with Modbus device on a backnet network? Uh, okay, so we're talking about gateways, I'm guessing you're referring to a converter converting Modbus to a backnet network. I'm guessing that's what you're getting at there. Uh, look, they, it depends on the on the converter or the router, if you like, the translator. That's what we usually call them as a translator that converts the Modbus to, to BACnet. Uh, there's lots of different devices out there that'll do that. On the, our products do it fairly well. Um, and it all depends on the development that the people have put in the background to, to make it work. Uh, you know, it's it's quite complex. I, I can't really answer that in much detail unless I, I knew what the issues were. But generally, uh, I haven't had that many issues with translators between the two at all. Yeah, sure. Um, I've got a question here from Sharif who's asking, generally, is the installation slash the commissioning cost of BACnet lower than Modbus? Yeah, interesting question. Uh, I don't know the figures. <laughs> I can't give you a costing, but I would say there's probably similar workload involved in both protocols. It, it's not really something that can be put a dollar value on without knowing the project architecture and, and what's what devices are on it. Uh, that would have to be evaluated during the project, you know, um, installation or, or quoting stage, I guess. But the commissioning side of it, BACnet is a lot easier to commission, for sure. Uh, but once Modbus is installed and working and, and commissioned correctly, it sort of works fairly stable as well. Sure. Um, and a question here as well from Peter Walter is what happened to the, um, the long protocol? Yeah, go along. It's still around. We don't use it much in Australia. Uh, it, it's a very heavily European and, and American based protocol. And it's a bit clunky, if you like, but um, it's still it's still around. But it depends on the manufacturer whether they choose to use it or not. So, yeah. Yeah, sure. Um, that seems to be the, the questions that have come through, Walter. So, look, thank you very much um, for getting through those questions um, and also for today's presentation. Um, as I did say, they will, the recording will be made available. So if people want to go over and watch these videos again, um, please feel free to do so. Um, so thank you, everybody, for um, registering and attending today's um, technology talk session. Um, if you would like to view or register for ERA's other upcoming technology talk um, and or streamlined sessions, um, please do so via the ERA website. So thank you all again for joining me. Thank you to Walter and of course the team at InnoTech and um, I look forward to you joining me once again. Take care everyone. Thank you everyone.